So we're at my place. Rob came and visited <laughs> me two years ago now. Yeah. And we went to Naylor Observatory and we did some shots. And we just used his 75 millimeter f1.8. And this time he came with a little bit more lens. Yeah. And a 300 f4, which I gotta say, I'm loving the looks of this lens. <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's kind of go over what is here okay, okay. so what, what did we need to do this <laughs> all right this um, is just a this is actually a benro video tripod but ben lent me this what they call a wedge yep and then i have two battery packs uh this is just a 10,000 milliamp usb uh, generic this is the anchor uh usb so 25,000 milliamp but it's it's recommended specifically by olympus for the em1x and of course it works with the om1 so i had the om1 with the um, 300 millimeter f4 and uh, this is uh, my sky watcher uh tracking device and i'll let ben talk about how that works and ben made actually this counterweight balance uh, to help balance this. So like I said, I'll let I'm too cheap to buy one. <laughs> <laughs> I know he's a DIY guy like me, right? <laughs> so uh, you can take it from here. So first thing we did is the wedge, what the wedge lets you do is it, is it really lets you refine your, your polar alignment. And that is something we kind of spent a good bit of our time the first part of the night, you know, cause we, we shot three different targets last night. We did Andromeda, we did the Pleiades, and we, then we did the Flame Nebula, okay? And going from target to target was pretty easy. I mean, basically just loosen these two knobs and then just repoint it, center it up, and then start shooting. Okay? Yeah, but he could find it like in 30 seconds. Yeah, it, it, finding <laughs> these targets, they're not too terribly easy. And Andromeda is actually kind of a hard one to find. You've kind of got to go off of Cassiopeia, but it's kind of in a no man's land. There aren't very many bright stars in the area. So I mean, you really gotta, gotta hunt for a little bit. And actually one of the things that I did, and I've actually seen other astrophotographers do this, is they buy the LED heads up uh, Oh, the red site. dot site. Yes, the red yeah. dot site that Olympus makes, or even a generic one. And they put it on him, they use that to kind of point to stuff in the sky. And and I, I was basically sighting along the top of this lens and, and doing it kind of that way. And then I would, looks at the viewfinder of course and, and uh, there's a little bit of a misconception out there i do want to correct and that's that the base of your tripod it doesn't necessarily have to be level because really the only thing that matters is that the rotational axis right here that that rotates along with your sky that just needs to be pointed at the pole at the north pole but that's really all that matters you know if this is not level that's not a problem now this wedge it's got two different axes of movement it's got these two little knobs right here which you can loosen and tighten and well you tighten both of them together and it kind of locks in place where so you loosen one and you tighten the other and it'll actually rotate the whole thing and this kind of helps you like move right and left in various fine increments so that you can sight through the polar scope here and, then, and of course this thing comes with an app which is the sa console by skywatcher it's on droid and it's on ios and with that app, it'll tell you based on what time of year it is and you clock on your phone, where Polar Polaris should go in, on the reticle that's inside here. And then of course there's a knob here in the front, which allows us to move this thing up and down as you can see right here. Now, once you get your polar alignment done, you tighten both of these and then you tighten this lever right here. And then you, you should avoid at all, con at all costs moving the, tr the legs or bumping into them, you know, be, be really careful as you're moving around that you don't bump into them, because then you'll, you'll knock your polar alignment off. Right, now, before we go any further, mm -hmm. explain what polar alignment is. Yeah, 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 polar alignment, basically we're getting the central axis of this portion of the tracker in line with the North Pole, because that's basically where the Earth is pointing, if you think of it as it spins on its axis. Okay. So we need this to point directly at the North Pole, basically. Mm -hmm. And then that, that gives me direction. What about this pitch? 
And, and the pitch that was that's basically controlled by this knob right down here. Right. And that's that's just to get this thing because it's going to depend on where you are on the globe. Like if you're in Florida, this thing's here. I'll, I'll do it right now. Mm -hmm. You're going to be more at like. You're going to be tilting it down like this more than around 30 degrees because there actually is a scale here in the front. Um, whereas up where I am here, I think I'm at 42 degrees. Mm -hmm. And so you set it about 42 degrees. If this were perfectly level, that, that would kind of get you close. Right, right. So that <clears throat> that's why we have to do pitch, not only mm -hmm. uh, y'all. Yes, guess, yes. Right? Because of that, the, the earth is round. It's not flat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, okay. so some people disagree about that these days. It's <laughs> beyond me. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then you use the scope to line up with a certain star that everything's calibrated to. Mm -hmm. So so once we're polar line and we got everything powered and everything, uh, then, then comes the pointing towards the sky. So there are two things you've got to do before you start pointing and two things you need to do after you start pointing. Number one is you've got to loosen this guy right here. And number two, there is another one right here at the base, which you also want to loosen. And loosening them beforehand is important because then you can move this thing around and be gentle as you move it around because we don't want to disturb the base. If you disturb the base, then you're going to knock your polar alignment off. And one other thing that we do before we start any of this really is you're going to loosen this axis right here, which is your main tension knob. And we're basically going to find balance with the counterweight if you're using a counterweight, which, which hopefully you do. A counterweight is nice because it allows you to use much bigger equipment. Yeah, and it puts a lot less stress on the motors, even if it's not that heavy. Yeah, yeah, a lot less. Yeah. yeah and you'll get better tracking accuracy if the motors are not strained as much. I, I have two custom settings in my cameras. Like I use custom three and custom four for different types of astronomy. And I also have the previews on them set up a little differently. So with the screen, my, what is it, night vision mode? is mm -hmm. turned on for custom mode four. So I typically switch to custom mode four and that's when I do my my alignment using the night vision boost mode. Yeah, that's, that, that's the old live view boost. Yes, so of course we have the dew shield extended and all that kind of stuff. Image stabilization is turned off. And, and Rob taught me something here cool. because I did? <laughs> with the 300, okay, oh, and this yeah. is different from the 100 to 400 that I have. When you turn off the image stabilization on the lens, it will also do it in the camera body because the two are synced. Yes. And I didn't know that. Okay, now, now with the 100 to 400 that I have, they're independent. If I turn the image stabilization, the lens on or off, it, it doesn't affect the camera body. So, so with my lens, I have to remember to turn it off on both. And, and I know some people have, have demonstrated that with a tripod, image stabilization being on and off doesn't matter. However, you got to remember that this is a tracking setup. The image stabilization will fight the tracker because the tracker is in fact moving ever, ever so slowly. Yeah, because it's not a tripod, it's a tracker. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We're we are dealing with a moving oscillus here. <laughs> right. But yeah, so we use the intervalometer. We set it up for, I think we just set it for like a thousand pictures or something like that. Of course, it didn't take that many, but yeah. um, with like a five to 10 second gap in between each picture and let this thing basically take one photo after another, after another, after another throughout the night. And we collected a whole ton of images. Yeah. And, and, and actually... Right now, both his camera and my cameras are, we got the lens caps on and we're taking darks right now. Okay, they're 60 second darks. And basically that's to kind of collect enough information so that you know, we can calibrate these frames later on and we process them. Yeah, yeah, processing's a whole other other thing. Ben will have something on his channel about that. But yeah. uh, the other thing is we were at ISO 1000. Yes. And I was wide open at F4. Yes. Uh, 60 yeah. second exposure. So we set the exposure separately from the intervalometer and then we just turn the intervalometer on because that's the shutter mechanism. Mm -hmm. I know when we came out here, because we came out here three different times mm -hmm. to change targets. And, and then of course, lastly, of course, to put a lens cap on the camera to start capturing darks at the end. Yeah, there's a human cost to this. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, getting up at night. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we got we got up at midnight. We got up at three a.m. and then of course we got up at six o'clock. Yeah. To to finish everything. I got about off. an hour sleep in between. 
basically all we had to do to change targets was we loosened one axis, loosened that axis, repointed, tightened them back up, and then and then here's one of the things. So to fine tune your composition, Skywasher gives you a knob right here which you can just turn and it will in fact kind of give you a micro adjustment in one axis. And then there's two buttons here in the side which you press and hold one of them and it will actually start to slew in one direction or the other in, in the RA. Now, if you use these, what I recommend you do is before you start your imaging sequence, give it about 10 seconds to settle because the, ga the gears will need to re-engage if they have to go back the other direction mm -hmm. when it starts tracking again. So, yeah. so that, that was kind of really all there was to changing targets last night. I mean, it was, you know, right. check starry sky, check starry sky autofocus, reposition this, and then start the sequence again. It's right. very, very easy, really. And just be conscious that on the Olympus cameras, the intervalometer turns off. Yes, you turn yeah. It back on. Yeah, you got to go back in the menu, turn it back on, right, to get it going again. I, I, I wish there was an option to turn that off. That you could have it. You know, once you turn it on, it just stays yeah. on. And then another minor tip you gave me was um, take just a few frames and mm -hmm. then check them to see if there's any eggshells or. Oh yes, yes, yeah, yeah. You don't want to set everything up. Go through all the trouble of setting everything up. Have one thing that you've missed and then go to bed and get up the next day and find out that the entire night was ruined. He, we took two or three frames and then he checked it, I guess, just for the eggshells. What else, did you look for anything else? Um, or? So I, I looked for eggshells. One of the things is I looked in the corners to kind of see how sharp the lens was. And I'm very impressed with the 300 F4 so far. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it, just to make sure that like at that aperture, we have the quality that we need. Um, Cause not all lenses can be used wide open in this. You know, yeah. the telephoto lenses seem to be more forgiving but the, like the portrait lenses, the standards and the wide angle lenses, um, the spherical aberrations are just picked up by stars and, and it's so blatantly obvious in them. That's, uh, yeah, those right there, you definitely need to, to check and make sure that, you know, the aperture that you have is small enough so that you know, your stars are gonna look round. Because everybody knows that a star is supposed to be round. When a star looks comet shaped in the outside edges of the frame, it, even the most amateur based person who, who doesn't know much about astronomy will, will pick out that issue. You got any more questions, Rob? Well, or? Uh, no, I think, um, you know, I, I turned the brightness of the live view way down uh, because when you're working at night, uh, this thing, it can mess up your night vision and it's so bright. So yeah. I turned it all the way down to negative seven. Olympus, if you're watching, could we have a red mode? <laughs> yeah, red that mode. That would be nice. <laughs> right, and this is this uh, Skywatcher. So you can buy the Skywatcher, the wedge separately, mm -hmm. and this counterweight separately. Or you can buy it all together as a kit, maybe 500 bucks. Uh, but you think about that, that's less than most lenses cost, right? Yeah, that is. <laughs> and you can do so much with this if you want to get an astrophotography. So tripod doesn't have to be perfectly level. Nope. Have really good power banks to run all night. Mm -hmm. uh, two, if you're going to use a heater, I would put, because we don't care if the heater dies, <laughs> me personally, but if the tracker and the camera dies, you're not going to get any pictures. <laughs> Yeah, so make sure so, those two have priority in your in your power train. Yeah, in the power train, right? So that's why that's why I put this separately. This is a normal aluminum tripod, but it's still the the more stable, the better. Mm -hmm. And some tripods they have spikes in the bottom, so in the ground it's better to use the spikes. But on the cement, it's better to just use the normal rubber feet. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and when you set those spikes in the ground, mm -hmm. you know, put some weight on your tripod like that to kind of like get them to sink in. Because uh, if you don't, then throughout the night they'll sink in and that, that could cause your polar alignment to go south. <laughs> right, right. All right, Ben, thanks for uh, helping me out tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to post the images on uh, my usual places, Instagram and Flickr, so you guys can check them out. And, um, I'm going to let Ben, we're going to go in and start doing the post-processing. So check out Ben's channel on how to do that part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll go through all, he'll go through all the images that way in the step-by-step. -step. 
because that's that's a whole other whole other side of the astrophotography is the post processing. Um, that's probably the only part where maybe the artistic part of the mind comes in, and that, that's simply because you know we have to worry about color balance. You know. Yeah, yeah. So um, check out Ben's channel, the Narrow Band Channel. Uh, thanks everyone for watching. I hope you like this video, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. All right. Thanks, Rob. Thanks. <laughs>